Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at some of the ICs that have stood the test of time, most of them being first introduced even before I was born, but are still in active production to this day. The focus of today's episode will be linear regulators. While these are not really state of the art, you will find components that are better in specific parameters, however the older ICs are usually cheaper, better understood and more widely used. So if you are curious about these and much more, then keep watching. So to start things off, let's remember what a linear regulator is. Specifically the series element regulator has a variable series element, a transistor, which is driven by an error amplifier that compares a reference voltage to the output voltage. The end goal being to stabilize the output to a specific value. Now in a more complex circuit, you will also have some sort of current measurement, so to check that the output does not exceed a certain threshold, and you can even have temperature sensing to deactivate the regulator in case of an overheating event. So in general, this is what a basic regulator is supposed to be and do. Now before the advent of integrated circuits, all of this was built using discrete transistors. The voltage reference, the comparators and the power stage. It can be more or less complex, but at the same time more or less performant. So one such example is this high voltage supply I built a while back, which has about 8 transistors, and another is this commercial power supply from the 1960s. Both of course work, but the number of individual components and thus the complexity is very high. One of the first ICs to integrate all of this into a single package was the UA723. It was first introduced in the late 60s by Fairchild Semiconductor and is one of the oldest ICs still in active production. While you will be able to find all sorts of modern day datasheets for this component from the manufacturers that still produce it, like this one from 1999 made by Texas Instruments, today I wanted to look at this application note from 1968. It explains the component in far more detail than the modern documentation. If you really need all this detail I'm not very sure, but at least it's an interesting read. So the document starts off by explaining what a linear regulator is, how the things are interconnected, then goes through some of the basics of voltage references, specifically Zener diode references, like the one used in the UA723, this being one of the key points of this component. So after a bit more explanations, we end up with a block diagram of our component, and we also have its internal schematic. So when we compare this to the basic block diagram of a general linear regulator, we can see all of the same things appearing. So we have our voltage reference, an error amplifier, a series regulating element, and a current monitorization circuit. However, to turn this into a functional circuit, you still need to interconnect everything. And a few pages later, we get the typical applications section. So here we will see that while you can build all sorts of things, you still need quite a few components to do so. So the most basic implementation, other than the chip itself, needs an extra 7 components, if we also count the input and output capacitors, which are not on the diagram. And of course, you can get far more complex designs. One of the circuits that I worked on a while back was this UA723 based laboratory power supply. It was quite a fun build, but this also highlighted some of the quirks of using this component. For starters, it needs at least 9.5 volts on the input because of the Zener reference, so most power supplies to this day have a much lower voltage band gap type of reference, then the Zener reference in the UA723 has the special property that the connection to the error amplifier is external, so this allows the addition of external filters which gives the possibility to turn this into a very low noise supply even by modern day standards. But anyway, even though the component has an internal series element, it is limited to about 150 milliamps, so in most applications the 723 will be used in conjunction with an external component to increase the regulated current, the power components being most often heatsink mounted. Regardless, I built this supply about 2 years ago. It's the supply 
I most commonly use since it's low noise, it's compact, I haven't been able to break it yet, and it also looks nice. So not much else to say about it other than it works. Last thing to mention about the 1960s document is that it contains a whole chapter on switching regulators. So while the UA723 is primarily intended to be a linear regulator, you can still use it as a hysteretic switching regulator. While we consider switch mode power supplies a more modern invention, these things were well known for quite a while. And this sort of supply is not great, the performance will be limited, but when efficiency is concerned, this can still be better than a linear regulator. While the UA723 and its variations are still in production, it's not all that common to use this component in a new design, mainly because of its complexity. Sure, it's simpler than a discrete circuit, but it still has more components than the next topic of the day, the LM317, introduced in the late 70s by National Semiconductor. First thing to notice is that this is a free terminal component. So already, the circuit that will end up being built around it should be far simpler. Also, it comes in various case sizes, even some high power ones. So it can be mounted directly on a heatsink. Let's see how this thing works. Now, the oldest document that I could find where this component is mentioned is this 1980s linear data book by National Semiconductor. Basically, this is a collection of datasheets and application notes of their various products at the time, including the LM317 and its variants. So first off, the 317 is part of a wider family of components. You have the LM117 and the LM217, and the difference in between these being that first of all the 117 and 217 are more accurate, and each of the three components has a different temperature range. The more well-known 317 is the most limited of the family. Now, other than these components, you also have the HV version, so the high voltage version of the component. So while the classical 317 is rated up to 40 volts, the HV version is rated up to 60 volts. And then you have the LM337 family, which is the negative voltage version of the 317. So here again, we have the same variations with the same different properties. And finally, if we look at a modern data sheet like this one from Texas Instruments, this will highlight that the classical 317 is 1.5 ampere rated, but there are also lower current versions. So you have the 317M for medium power, which is rated for 0.5 amperes, and the 317L low power rated for 0.1 amperes. So there's quite a lot of components to choose from when working with this particular IC. But what makes it so special? Well, if we look at the typical application, we will see the sheer simplicity of it. In its most basic form, other than the IC and the input and output capacitors, you just need two extra components. So using this basic formula, you can determine the value of the two resistors to set any voltage that your circuit might need and making the lower resistor adjustable will also allow a fine tuning if you're using trimming resistors, or you can make a fully adjustable power supply if this is a potentiometer. Now, one of the interesting applications that is possible thanks to the negative voltage version of the IC is the creation of a differential power supply. So you can use a double potentiometer to adjust both the positive and the negative side at the same time, and since the 317 and 337 have more or less the same operation, just with inverted polarity, you don't really need any special measure to create such a circuit. This sort of design can become quite handy when working with op amps or other differentially supplied circuits. Final thing to observe is that the 317 has a built-in power transistor, which can handle up to 1.5 amperes. So sure, you can use external components to boost the current, but in most cases today, when linear regulators are used, 1.5 amperes should be plenty. Anyway, having the power transistor built into the chip allows the built-in thermal protection to act in case of an over-temperature event. So you don't need any special measures, the component should be able to protect itself 
in case of overheating. This is something that the UA723 did not have. The LM317 is a common choice when you need a variable or otherwise non-standard voltage linear regulator, and you will find it in both low as well as high power packages. And there's even a negative voltage version for it. But can we make an even simpler circuit? Well, we can, if we already know the output voltage and the exact value is somewhat standard. And this brings us to another product of the 1970s present in our old linear handbook, the LM78XX series, of which we can have a better look in this more modern day datasheet, since here we have a very nice table with all of the variations. So in short, all of these are free terminal fixed voltage regulators, and depending on the exact series, these can have fixed outputs of 5, 12, 15, or you can have some more voltages, or even more voltages, well, each series has something else. And from a current point of view, the typical LM78XX is rated for 1.5 amperes, but you also have the M version, which is medium power for 0.5 amperes, and an L version, so low power, rated for 0.1 amperes. And of course, for these modern components, you will find them in all sorts of packages. So based on the exact series, you will find different things, including SMDs. Now, the main property to highlight about this component is the typical application. Other than the IC, you just need a couple capacitors. And that's all that you need to build a fixed voltage regulator. So the main reason to use this part is the sheer simplicity of the circuit that is built around it. Anyway, the last derivative to mention is the LM79 series and the various related families, the 79L and the 79M, which are more or less the same thing as the 78 family, it's just that these are the negative voltage versions of the regulator. Now, there's not much left to say about the 7800 series, other than if you need to build a fixed voltage linear regulator and you cannot be bothered to look for a highly specialized component, this will probably do. Whenever you need 5 volts or more, for either digital or analog circuits, the 7800 series is a safe bet, at least to get things going. But what about fixed voltages below 5 volts? Now, in the 70s and 80s, most low voltage circuits, mainly the digital ones, had the smallest supply at 5 volts. This was the standard in TTL logic, so you didn't really need specialized regulators for lower voltages. However, the 90s and the 21st century changed this. Thanks to new process nodes and power efficiency reasons, most modern digital electronics works below 5 volts. And this brings us to the last component of the day. The LD1117 family introduced sometimes in the early 90s. These come in various fixed voltages, up to 5 volts, but they also have a adjustable version. So what makes this component special compared to the 78 or the 317 ICs? Well, this specific regulator is part of a class of components called low dropout regulators, or LDOs. Now, dropout stands for how large the voltage difference between the input and the output needs to be for the circuit to work as expected. Low dropout is smaller than non-low dropouts, so it's better. However, low is also a relative term. A more accurate way to describe the difference between an LDO and a standard regulator has to do with the control architecture. So for the standard linear regulator, it is built around an NPN or N-channel transistor structure, whereas the LDO is built around a PNP or PMOS structure. These of course could be built from multiple transistors combining both NPN and PNPs, but the important difference lies in the fact that the control circuit, the error amplifier's inputs, are swapped. So without going into too many details, the small change has a big impact in the feedback loop and stability of the circuit. While most standard linear regulators will work with a couple hundred nanofarad capacitors and whatever you find at the bottom of your junk drawer, for the LDO, there is a critical accent applied on the exact value range and DSR, especially for the output capacitor there is such a thing as too little 
or too much, both extremes being able to drive the regulator into an unstable operating region. Now, I cannot stress enough how much hair loss a quick glimpse at these stability parameters will end up saving. It's very easy to get an LDO unstable when using very high ESR electrolytics or very low ESR ceramics. Or when you don't have enough capacitance since you forgot to take into account the DC bias loss of the ceramics. This of course is valid for any LDO, not just the 1117. Now, for this particular part, most datasheets don't go into too much detail, but at least the Texas Instruments datasheet does clearly mention that at least a 10 microfarad, both input and output capacitance is needed, and for the output, the ESR of somewhere between 0.3 and 22 ohms is required. Now, since this part was initially released in the 90s, the only low ESR component at the time were tantalum capacitors so you didn't really need any more details. But today, you can easily put a 10 microfarad ceramic capacitor and not realize that, first of all, it will not have 10 microfarads, but less when placed under a DC bias, and secondly, you can easily get a ceramic with an ESR that is lower than 0.3 ohms. So this might require a bit of attention. But what do I know? In most places where I've seen this component in the wild, various development boards, microcontroller boards, or even motherboards, these stability concerns don't seem to be all that critical. The design of the component and the area around it isn't all that special. In the end, linear regulators are still a big part of modern day electronics. And depending on your application, you might need some state of the art component that was just released, or in a lot of cases, you could probably get away with a far cheaper time-tested component that was released decades ago. And that will work just fine. So with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.